Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to the session. I um, really appreciate you uh, taking a chance and coming to something that you may not have ever uh, thought of doing before. Um, I'd like to start off just by doing what I call an adrenalizer, just telling you a quick story about course correction. And um, of course, course can mean of course, course can mean different things. It can mean uh, a course for a race. It can mean a course you're taking in class. It can also mean uh, just the course you're taking in life, um, uh, your life's course. And one of the beautiful things about um, America and, and capitalism is that we're free to make as many corrections as we need. And, you know, we're kind of in control of our own lives. And uh, one example of that in just swimming is I did the escape from Alcatraz triathlon probably hard to tell from uh, what I gained a few pounds since then, but uh, the waves are so bouncy and pushing you around so much out there that you take four or five strokes and you've got to literally stop and look up and realize that, oh my gosh, I'm heading straight out to sea through the Golden Gate Bridge, and then you correct your course again and you keep going and then you look up and you're like, oh, now I'm headed to the Bay Bridge, and you, you kind of do this. And I think that education is kind of like that because you find new things that are interesting, uh, you find things that you have to learn that you didn't know you needed before, and you're constantly correcting as you go along and as you get a little older, a little more mature, maybe you make less corrections. In fact, some of the professional swimmers never look up. I don't know how they do it, but somehow they know where they're going and uh, <laughs> uh, it seems like magic. But that's how I think uh, learning goes throughout life. And one of the things that um, I think our educational systems could use is a little bit more letting the individuals correct their own courses. Um, letting industry help us provide the information to students so they can help determine their own uh, direction. And of course, getting more information for uh, the universities, the colleges, the, the, the professors, the lecturers, the, the teachers to help them uh, improve and, and make better courses for their own material. And so with that, um, what we're going to do is I'm going to first start off by uh, um, asking you what you are interested in and why you're attending this session. And then after that, I'm going to go into uh, explaining what our own conference is, uh, what student camp is, um, why you should care, how it works, uh, how you get started, and then um, maybe just some other Q&A after that. So first of all, I'm just curious. I, I do recognize a few of you here, about half of you actually, um, but uh, the other five or so of you, I'm just curious what attracted you to the session and are there any particular questions or topics that you'd like to make sure we get addressed before uh, while we're in the session? Who wants to go first? Yes? I'm looking for uh, class activities that, uh, that will cause the students to work together on a project to accomplish something, so teaching them group dynamics and I'm um, looking for something to interject in my classroom as an activity. Great, great. Uh, well, we'll not only have an unconference to talk about, there's also in activities within unconferences that could also meet those objectives. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, in, in addition to that, uh, outside the classroom, so I was looking for things where students love to get together and do things, and so um, why not? Why not help them? Right. Good. Okay. Very good. And we were talking about hackathons uh, last night. Yeah. Okay. Did you have something to say? Um, well, um, we're a Microsoft authorized refurbisher. Uh huh. So we have student interns working in the lab refurbishing systems. Cool. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of a way to um, maybe do that in a sort of a, like a weekend. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I've got some ideas. Just we'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, make sure that we come back to that towards the end because I've got some ideas on that. Uh, and just uh, the others that we hear from, I'm just curious, what, what, what attracted you to the session? Because I know it's a little out there sometimes for some folks. I do events for my cons. I'm just curious. I always think about how to do that. Ah, okay, good. It should be with you I'm just curious about that. Okay, thank you. Very good. And you too? Yes, I have uh, an active club and thought maybe this would be an opportunity for them to do something self-motivated. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, great idea. The club. I hadn't thought of that. Very good. Yeah. And when you say Rocha, are you with a community college? Okay. And a, a Rocha, how would that work? Oh, uh, 
That's exactly what I want to okay. learn from this. Right, right, right. How, how to do a roadshow account. Because I think and about doing where, you know, everything is outside and girls and boys go outside by day to do some hands on activities. Okay, good. Okay, we'll definitely come back to that too. So thank you very much for sharing with me. Um, all right, so first of all, just a really quick about me. I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. For those of you not from the California area, uh, one of the things I love about it is that it's a learn by doing uh, Cal State. And uh, I think the employers really appreciate that. And you can tell that they do because of all of the colleges in California, it has the second highest uh, salary per graduate, uh, per student that graduates above all the UCs. It's pretty impressive. But it's because it's a very hands-on, learn by doing school. They really push the ideas of doing internships and that kind of thing. And I, I was very impressed by that and I've noticed since I graduated that uh, employers seem to like that too. And that kind of impacted, impacts my way of thinking about this. Uh, I started off as a consultant and technical trainer. Uh, I was very aggressive on new technologies. It was actually in the first group of um, consultant or uh, trainers uh, trained by Microsoft to teach Microsoft Active Server pages. So I was literally uh, tied, for, tied for first place in um, the first to actually be certified to teach active server pages back in 1996. Um, and I kind of stayed on the cutting edge of technology and uh, really was pushing the envelope with web APIs back when um, you would never build a website that relied on another website back in the you know, 2000 time frame. Uh, but I was kind of pushing that envelope and doing a lot of that. I was hired by PayPal actually to uh, be a web API evangelist and, and, and push the idea of using other services from other companies in your website. Uh, eventually ran the PayPal developer network, left to go join a startup that was a marketplace of web APIs, which, which is where I kind of learned about um, cloud computing uh, in, 19, uh, in 2006. Um, got involved with the um, unconference movement around then and eventually started something called Cloud Camp, which I'll get to later. But Cloud Camp was a cloud computing unconference. Uh, and then that kind of spawned off other camps that we'll talk about. Today what I do is uh, I make mo I've made money since 2006 basically being a developer uh, relations consultant. In other words, helping companies who are trying to market technologies to technology people. And if you're a marketing person in the company and you're not a technologist and you're trying to market technology to technology people, uh, really hard to do because technology people have a really sensitive bullshit meter. And if you're a marketing person, that's uh, it's difficult to deal with. So I, that's how I generally make money is, is by helping uh, marketing people talk to technology people. And that's how uh, I got into doing so many technology events, especially unconferences, because at unconferences, very low on the bullshit meter. It's just community discussion. They get to talk amongst themselves. Um, and you also find early adopters, and that's of course what uh, most new companies are looking for. So anyway, that's just about me. Uh, Cloud Camp, uh, we started in 2008, and uh, really only thought we were going to do a couple a year, and it just went crazy. Uh, folks really liked the idea. Um, I'll get into some more background, but it's it's really gone over all over the world. We've had Cloud Camps and just about every major technology region or city um, around the world. Uh, over 350 cloud camps to date. I've gone to about half of them. So I've spent the last, uh, until, until a year ago when my, my wife and I had a baby, I was traveling literally like a different country every month. It was, it was a lot of traveling. But it was a lot of fun. I learned a heck of a lot. And I'm trying to bring that back to the States basically. And, bring what I learned about what's going on in the new ways of educating people um, and especially around what's going on with cloud computing technologies, bringing that back here and, and helping us understand not only uh, how to use it ourselves uh, but also how to then market it back out to the world. And that's, and that's really I think a mission of mine is, uh, just taking a side step for a moment here. Um, okay, we kind of invented the, the Internet, right? here in the U.S. Uh, we didn't invite, invent the web, which is Tim Berners-Lee, of course. Um, but just a side note, the Internet has been both a blessing 
and a curse for us here, I think. The curse part is is that we kind of had a lot of the technical know-how and, and knowledge all sewn up in our own sort of universities and books and all that kind of stuff. And you, you kind of had to come here to get it until about 10 years ago or, you know, one of the other affluent countries. But what did the Internet do? It made that all available to everybody else, which is really wonderful for everybody else. <laughs> but it produced pressure on us at the, especially the lower, uh, you know, task-oriented jobs, uh, lower skill task-oriented jobs, which I think is part of the reason why we're struggling in the U.S. is because we've got all this competition. So, just I'm kind of on a side note here, but um, I've I've seen it. I've been all over the world. I've seen them learning, and they're learning like crazy because it's they haven't had this opportunity until recently, and they're really excited about it. So if you think about it, their level of income is going up. They see it and they're excited about it, and that just motivates them more. What's happened here? Our income's been like flat. Sometimes it's gone a little bit down. And even though our standard of living is so much greater than most of the rest of the world, even today, it doesn't feel that way, right? It feels like we're under more pressure. I think. So I, in my own little way, am trying to figure out how we can learn from what's going on around the world about what makes us special. And one of the things that I know for a fact that we are special is in group dynamics. You put us in a room and just say, talk amongst yourselves, and I've seen it. We do it. We do it really, really well. And you go to other countries and they're not that good at it. They're hesitant. I can ask questions here in a room full of people and you'll see the hands go up. You go to other countries, mostly like Asian countries, you ask a group of people a question, if any hand goes up, it's going to be like this and they're going to be looking around. They're afraid to speak out. For now, all right? It's changing, I'm sure. But right now, we're really good at this group dynamic thing. And that's part of what the end conference is about, what I'm here to share, is that let's take advantage of that. We can do it better than anybody, and let's take advantage of it now while we're still leading in that area, too. So, um, yes, I've put on unconferences all over. I've seen the group dynamics in action, and we are excellent at it. I've also started uh, working with other groups, um, creating other unconference organizations, working with other unconference organizations, helping others uh, get started. Some of them are here today, actually. Um, SB Forum is my local uh, technology association that I belong to. I've belonged to it for uh, um, over probably about 15 years now. Um, that's, that's the local technology association I call home. All right, that's where I feel. Um, I fill up my sort of community technology needs. Um, there's other organizations that are camp related that I've helped start or involved with. Um, community Leadership camp Summit, which is really a camp, off camp, marketing camp, big data camp, product camp. Um, I've helped start some of these. I've worked with others. Uh, a couple of the folks in the room here actually uh, created marketing camps. Is that all volunteer? Or yeah, all volunteer and all free events. Okay. So what is an unconference? How many of you have heard of an unconference before? Okay. All right. So, okay. So, an uncom. Okay. How about open spaces technology? Anybody heard of that? Okay. All right. Well, let me start with that. Um, but the short answer is that an unconference is really a, a conference, but where the agenda doesn't exist until the attendees create it. Okay. So, in other words you have an empty schedule. You know you're going to have a conference, but you have an empty schedule until you ask the attendees what they want that schedule to be. Okay? It's based on a concept called open space technology, which is invented by a guy named Harrison Ford, uh, Owen uh, back in the, night, in, the, in the 80s, actually. Um, and it was born out of necessity. He was running a conference. He really couldn't uh, manage all the time it took. And, uh, 
He basically said, you know what? I know you guys all want to do this conference, so why don't you just all show up, and we'll figure it out when you get there. And then he kind of it worked, and he's like, wow, that, was, that actually worked really well. And so he, he kind of formalized it into a process he called Open Spaces Technology. Open Spaces Technology basically is you put a big schedule on the board, it's all empty. Those are the spaces. So open spaces in a big conference schedule grid. And then you give people a sheet of paper and they write down the topic and they go put it on the grid. There's your conference. Okay. Now there's a little more to it than that, but that is by and large the main concept that open spaces um, is about, is letting the people decide what is the conference is going to be about. Uh, I learned about it at something called Food Camp, which is, if you're, if you're familiar with O'Reilly, uh, or you know, Tim O'Reilly, or O'Reilly Media, uh, he had an event called Friends of O'Reilly Camp, Food Camp, and it was invite only, and it was a bunch of super bright, you know, what they call them alpha geeks, uh, proposing topics, so everything was interesting, uh, but that's a very rare experience to have that many sort of top um, technologists in, in an event. But they ran it this way and really let the, the, the folks, you know, come up with their own ideas and talk about whatever they wanted to. Uh, and, but it was invite only and some of the folks didn't get invited the next year and they're like, wait, this isn't right. We should be able to do this ourselves. And they created Bar Camp, which is uh, complimentary to food, the food bar, right? And there actually happened to be a food bar bar with drinks at food camp. And, but that's where the idea came up with is bar and then foo bar. And um, and eventually that spawned off others. Uh, mashup camp and then eventually I started cloud camp. But I learned it hands on at mashup camp. That's one I was a volunteer at and really got involved. Learned about a lot about it that way. Um, so uh, why should you care? Well, there's some real value that I think the community college system can gain from these events. Not only do you learn, obviously there's a lot of learning that goes on, but more in particular, um, you can discover new technologies um, through inviting industry folks to your event. So have an, a conference put on by your students where they spend most of their time organizing the conference, not so much teaching the technologies, although they can certainly do that too, but then invite industry to, to participate in it. So it's a mix of students and industry. And I've seen it work, not uh, put on by a community college before, but I've, we've had them at community colleges and, and there's absolutely no reason why the students couldn't organize it themselves and do it, run it the same way. Uh, it's so dependent upon community to provide the content, the students really don't have to do anything in that regard. They just simply have to get the word out and provide the space for the event to occur. And community colleges have the space. We've been doing something called Silicon Valley Code Camp at Foothill for like the last six year or so years. It grew from a couple hundred people the first year and now it's up to over 2,000 people attending every year, like 3,000 or more people register. It's a very impressive event. And uh, of course, I wouldn't expect that they would all get that big, but they could. And of course, you know, that generates some revenue, by the way, through sponsorships uh, for the college. Um, at the very minimum, it pays for <laughs> pays people to come to work uh, and do security and things like that. Um, but also it helps, I think, students identify job-related opportunities. Because if they're going to attend a session where uh, technology uh, companies are participating and presenting, uh, they're going to get to learn what's happening now. All right? So it's it's a way of hearing industry folks talk about what's going on in industry and what the new, newest and latest technologies are um, and, and actually engage with those people and ask them questions and that helps, I think, excite them about what's going on in the industry and um, identify uh, job opportunities uh, through that. Also, I think it helps perhaps you align your curriculum more with what's going on in industry. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this concept, but uh, it's just more of that, right? You have some folks come and speak. Um, you can tell where the interest is based on how many people go to sessions 
or um, uh, especially if somebody from industry presents a session and lots of people from the community go to that session, you can get a sense that that's a hot technology. So there's a little bit of crowdsourcing going on there to help you kind of see what's going on in your community. <coughs> so how's that again? Well, you know, this is an event organized by your students. You know, a lot of you don't have time for another activity, so if you can uh, let the students do a lot of the leg work or the grunt work, um, obviously it's going to take some time on your end, but uh, I'm also providing free open source uh, organizational tools to help you so that you don't have to, um, uh, you know, build a new website and all that kind of stuff for the conference. By the way, you can use anybody's technology. I'm not, I'm just doing this because I do it a lot and I've done it. Um, and uh, the students don't need to know the technology to put on the conference. It helps, of course, but you certainly don't need to. Uh, and then on, at a very minimum, those who are helping out are going to learn collaboration tools and techniques and uh, marketing techniques, get the word out. So they're going to learn some practical skills as a part of it. Uh, it's also an event for your technical community. So don't think about it as an event for you. Think about it as an event for your community. You really want to engage them and find out what they're excited about. That's going to help you, as I said before. So invite everyone to participate. Consultants, employers, students, instructors from other departments within your school, other schools. Invite them. Be the school in your region that does this. Because let me tell you, others are going to do it. You might as well be the one that does it. And once you kind of get going, you could be like Foothill College. There's already a big code camp now in Silicon Valley. I don't think there's, uh, there's probably room for a couple others, but there's always going to be a big one, and it's always going to be a foothill as long as foothill wants it. So it's going to, they're going to have that um, attention and awareness. Uh, make it an open, open house. So yes, you're putting it onto the community, but you can also raise awareness for what you're doing at your campus. So you can share uh, your ITC program, RCT program. You can share your schedules of classes. Raise awareness for um, what's going on and uh, generate um, potential revenue that way through um, students. Uh, encourage feedback from your industry. Let them, uh, they're there, take advantage of that. Ask them, you know, hey, what should we be teaching? What, what can, how can you help? Maybe get some advisors for um, your program that way. Uh, and then also uh, identify and collaborate with other programs that are going in in the Valley. It's a great opportunity to let other programs, uh, they may compete with you, they may part um, collaborate with you, but become that center of that event that goes on in your community where people find out about the other programs. Right? And um, it'll, I think it will also help you identify programs that you might want to collaborate with. Some additional benefits, you can do other projects um, or activities at these events. You can have a job fair. You can have uh, short hands-on technology uh, workshops, you know, um, I don't know, how to integrate with Twitter or something like that, you know, something that's just a couple hours. You can do hackathons, you can demonstrate projects of your own, you can have your students kind of do a show and tell if you want. Um, you can have a startup competition. You've already generated awareness. People are coming to learn about new things. Why don't you let them uh, have a competition? Take, follow up with the people who uh, participated last year and see if any of them started anything. Maybe somebody actually found some uh, teammates and created a little startup based on um, your last event. Uh, but, you know, at a very minimum, you're going to generate awareness um, with industry who now might want to recruit from your school. Uh, government, raise awareness, maybe get some uh, funding. Uh, other departments, um, kind of overwrote the thing there, but uh, who might be able to then learn how to integrate some ICT curriculum into their non-ICT curriculum. Uh, and then, by the way, self-promotion for you, right? So it turns out to be a successful program. You're now uh, recognized for that. So why community colleges? Now, I kind of just went on here with a bunch of thoughts, but um, basically uh, I think there's a, a movement, a trend towards smaller bite-sized content that uh, em employees, contractors, consultants, they need to learn new technologies. You don't need to go get a 
degree for the new technology. You just need to learn it in a, maybe like a couple days or a one class at a community college would be great. And I think that uh, I've heard this many times here. I already experienced it myself. Uh, there's some new technology that comes out. You know, within a year or two, it's probably in the junior college or um, community college, and, and um, uh, that's an opportunity for the workforce to get a new skill, raise their own um, level of uh, capabilities, and uh, but you don't need a four-year school for that. You know, just just keep your skills up. To date by going to the local uh, community college and, and learning that way. We heard this morning from um, what was his name? Carl. Carl. Carl, right? Yes. From Carl, you know that there's a lot of folks who are starting consulting companies based on what they learn at a community college. I absolutely believe that. Um, and there's just too much to keep up with. So uh, having a community college that's that's offering short courses and events like this to kind of uh, keep the information going in short bursts. I think is just really appropriate. Um, and then this is just some comments I heard from the event the, this at this conference. Uh, just keeping up with how other people are learning is great. Uh, somebody here, um, uh, Beth Cataldo of uh, City College San Francisco, basically said that they they ended up getting out of sync with how high school students were learning, and they needed to adjust. And uh, you know, more the interaction you have with the community, I think you'll see how other people are learning. Um, also, uh, employers sometimes they want something very specific, and so uh, you can engage with them. And, and maybe there's opportunity to run workshops or classes that uh, are only offered maybe for a year or less, but based on industry demand. So how does this work? Well, again, like we said before, there is no agenda until the attendees made one up. Okay. Um, now at boot camp, that really meant that there was nothing until people showed up, and then they made the agenda. Bar camp was the same way, literally nothing, except for bar camp decided that, hey, you know what, we're going to have the event on Saturday. Let's all get together Friday night and vote. That gives folks at least the evening to kind of put their slide deck together. Okay, so there's a little bit of a pre-organization going on, just a little bit. Uh, Mashup Camp um, added a different flavor. They added something called speed geeking, where you could demonstrate the mashups that you've built in addition to the, the breakout sessions. So what we started seeing over time is that the unconference concept as a platform worked great, and then you could kind of add additional activities to that or, or preparations. Uh, at Cloud Camp, we ended up evolving in a schedule, a schedule that um, I'll get to in a moment that changed over time because we've been going on for about four and a half years now and the industry changed and so we, we kind of evolved our schedule to, to actually take advantage of the fact that we went from early adopters to, um, well we went from bleeding edge to early adopters to uh, sort of early major majority um, industry folks and they needed different types of engaging activities so uh, we actually evolved over time. And other camps, marketing camp, um, has uh, its own format. So there's variations on the theme, but here's a typical schedule. If this would be like a one-day event, where you start off in the morning, like any other conference, with registration and copy. Uh, you might have a, a welcome and introduction orientation. You have to spend a little bit of time on orientation because a lot of people are new to the, the concepts. So you need to explain it to them. Uh, you might have a keynote or in our case, we do something called lightning talks, which are um, five-minute talks. We might give them to a sponsor. We might give them to somebody in the community who's been doing something interesting. Uh, they're never marketing or sales pitches. So even if it's a sponsor, they're required to not do a marketing or sales pitch. Uh, they might do a case study or something that's relevant to their product line, but at least it's going to be about what's going on with, in the community or with customers. But that's just a little something to get the juices flowing. And then uh, we go right into the unconference. And the way that works is you propose a breakout session. Um, uh, you know, show that sheet of paper. You give anybody an opportunity to go and fill out the sheet of paper and everyone gets on a line and stands up and says, here's my session. And they go put it on the board. So everyone hears from the session organizer uh, the topics 
<coughs> and then put it on the board, and, and that's how it works. Yes? So the sessions are people, if the people come and they want to share their information? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, you have, so in the kind of purest form of the unconference, there is no predetermined agenda. So when folks show up, um, you might have consultants, let's say, who have been working on some new technology and they want to not only share what they've learned, but also learn from others because it's a new emerging technology and a discussion might be the best way to help everyone go further, right? So they might say, you know, I'm just thinking back to my early days, they might say, um, web APIs, uh, SOAP or REST, you know, what should we use? And then you might get a bunch of people together and, well, oh, this is the benefit of SOAP and this is the benefit of REST. Hey, there's this new thing called AJAX, you know, like, and you have a discussion and you might learn some new technology that way. What about RSS, you know? And it really is a, a great way to at least identify what the options are and maybe hear some pros and cons about it. So that's, yes, you'll hear, you'll get a lot of that. Um, I noticed that looking at your schedule, that, that takes 50 minutes. And I'm thinking, wow, this must be a small number of people. But you, know, you said they all get in the line and they come up and they fill out the paper and then they place it on the board over there. Yeah. So all that happens in 15 minutes. There's probably only about you know, 30, 40 people. Right? Yes or no? Uh, yes and no, I should say. Um, notice I put the coffee break right after it. Okay, because it actually does take a lot longer. Um, but uh, some people, need time. So what ends up happening is uh, you might go up for 15 minutes and you might have uh, 10 sessions, which is, you might, 10 sessions would be like an event where you have like one or 200 people, okay? Uh, you might have like 10 sessions. And that might take 15 minutes right now. Um, but then it takes time to put it on the schedule and, and, and put the schedule up and let people see the schedule and that can all happen during the coffee break. So when people vote on those, what do you give to a person? Do people vote on the hot Yeah, so there are different ways of handling this. In fact, there's probably a dozen different ways of handling this. But um, the most common, easy way to do it is when somebody stands up and says, I'd like to talk about web APIs, and they say one or two sentences about it, then the facilitator might say, who here is interested in web APIs? Okay, and you'll have hands go up, and you write a little number on the top of the corner. And if you've really been uh, thoughtful, on the session grid, it's organized by room. The room um, name will have a number next to it. And then that person knows, well, I had 15 people interested in my session. There's a room that holds 15 people or 20 people. I can, I can safely go in that room. I don't need, to, I don't need the 40 person room, right? So you definitely have, um, you're very, it's nice that there are all these different ways to do this, but you can, you can rapidly adjust the schedule and um, the room sizes and the topics based on a quick feedback loop from the audience. Uh, that's like the simple, basic way of doing it. There are other ways of doing it. For example, um, like bar camp, they decided to do this basically the night before, okay? Um, now that has disadvantages that people got to come for twice, right? Um, another way of doing it is to actually have the proposal set, the session proposals online before the event. That's how marketing camp and product camp do it. Other camps do it that way as well. And so you have a, a, a process of letting people propose topics and then as people register for the event, they also vote on the topics that they want to attend. And so you'll have a filtering process. And if you have too, this is great, by the way, for uh, if you have too many topics because you can take the ones that are the top and put those in your event. Um, and uh, it also it turns out that it's a great promotional technique because the people who propose the topic will say, hey, to their community of friends, vote on my topic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it helps get the word out about your event. Um, it also gives them confidence that if they are near the top, they're going to have people showing up. So they'll spend more time preparing their, their presentation, right? Um, anyway, so... That's just, that's sort of that product, uh, it looks like it's a very neat way of doing it. And if you do it already, you know, as pretty as you can use the web and putting up uh, whether they would like to attend the session or not. But 
what are the disadvantages? Actually, it's very successful. It, it is probably the single most successful model. Uh, I still like the hybrid model where you might um, have all of your morning sessions or, or the first half, maybe the first two rounds or three rounds are done this way, but still reserve uh, some sessions for on-the-spot session proposals at the event. In fact, what you can also do and what we did with uh, Marketing Camp is the sessions that didn't make it to the top still have a chance to get voted on in the morning at the event to you know, get into the, the, the final round that day. So you still have a, anybody want to propose a session uh, the morning of the event. And I, I really like that combination because sometimes people will show up at the event and they're like, oh my gosh, you're here? Oh wow, you know, Susan's here too. We've been meaning to get together. Let's just, maybe somebody else wants to get together. Let's have a session. And that would never have happened otherwise. Right? Something about that, like spontaneity, uh, spontaneous sort of discovery is, is magical. Uh, so yeah, so the proposed breakout sessions is where the complication, that, that's where it's complicated, but, and there's a lot of different ways to do it, uh, but that really is where the sort of magic is happening. Because once you get the sessions, you know, you're just going to have breakout sessions, right? It's kind of run like a regular conference at that point. Now, um, to be fair, it's still not a regular conference. Um, a lot of the sessions are breakout sessions, or I'm sorry, are, are discussions, right? Um, there, there's all sorts of different types of activities. So we invented something called the unpanel. And I'll get into that in a moment. But basically with an unpanel, you don't have your questions and you don't even have your panelists, but you create them on the fly. So we've kind of, a lot of this kind of spirit of spontaneousness has kind of created new types of activities you can do at the event. And then at the end, I always encourage for those who stayed the entire time, do something for them. Do a summary or wrap-up of what happened. If you, know, if you have a, a still have a core of you know, maybe 20 or 30 percent of the people who showed up in the morning, do a wrap-up. Hey, what happened in your session? And do a little sharing. And that's a, a really nice way to kind of end the day. Ten minutes. Oh, gosh. Okay. So I'm going to move through some just some examples. Oh, boy, this is really blurry. Didn't look this blurry on my laptop. But uh, this is kind of what a... Um, a session grid looks like for a big unconference. All right, this is one where it's maybe 300 people or something like that. This is a, and, and this was actually a two-day event uh, for a community leadership summit. And of course, something like community leadership summit, you got community leader. I mean, they're <laughs> they're very outgoing. So lots of sessions. You you may only have four or five people in a session, but that's okay. It's okay. Uh, quick and dirty. Unconferences. I've done them where proposed the event the night before. Very few people show up. Maybe 30, 40 people. You can still do an event, and it works fine. It's not as exciting because it's exciting to have more people there. Uh, but you know, we had had like three rounds of sessions in two rooms, and it worked great. We didn't have you know, we just made a very quick and dirty. Like you can make a session grid like this in about 10 minutes. So it's pretty easy. Um, with Product Camp and Marketing Camp, there was voting that went on during the event. Um, so what happens is the sessions that don't make it in the morning, uh, predetermined sessions, still get put on a wall for the afternoon schedule and then you give people dots and they can go put the dot on the session that they want and that's how you determine the voting uh, that, that the morning of the event. Um, so there's lots of different types of formats. Of course, regular standard presentation, group discussion, moderated panel. The unpanel, it works like this. It's very simple. I created it, and I created it basically out of um, necessity because I didn't want to just do group discussions the whole time. Um, and the main reason why I created the unpanel was that with an unconference, you get everyone there in your own room for like the introduction at the beginning of the event. You're all there to talk about cloud computing, so why not have a quick session to answer quick questions, right? Why have to wait until you break out into sessions? Some questions about cloud computing may not require a whole hour, so everyone's here in a room. Let's find out what you want to talk about and let's do some quick hits and get some quick answers. 
So what I say is, hey everyone, let's do an unpanel. In fact, the first time I did this, I literally just made it up as I went. Like, let's do an unpanel. We don't have the uh, questions and we don't have the panelists. So, um, in fact, I used to do it like this. But before we get to that, who here considers themselves an expert in cloud computing? Right? You get a group of 100 people, you're going to get three or four of them who've got the gumption to raise their hand. And so you'll see some people, oh, I'm an expert. Great, thank you, you're on the panel. And now they've got to come up and sit in a chair and now take your questions. So uh, it's kind of funny, the audience will laugh. It's, it's kind of a funny way. Now a better way to do it, I discovered, was get the questions first. So who here has questions? It's not as funny, but it works better. And then what I do is write them down on the, on the whiteboard or on the flip chart, write them down. So you take the questions from the audience. Once you get the questions, you then say, who here can answer at least one of these questions? And you get a few more hands going up. And you say, great. You know, and then you just quickly put up some chairs, have them sit down, give them a microphone. Who wants to go first? There's your own panel. By the way, it works fabulous if you have if you want to do a short conference. So if you have a conference that's only gonna be like two or three hours, there's not enough time to go into all the different breakout sessions and address everything. It works great. Highly, highly recommend it. And also for smaller events where there might be 20 or 30 or 40 people um, and they might all have different interests. Well, it doesn't make sense to have a breakout session for each one of those interests. So the unpanel works great. Now I know we're running out of time here. I just want to talk about some other things. You can do hackathons this way. Do the lightning talks. Do a couple breakout sessions and then spend the rest of the day programming, hacking. I did this for Stanford. We did a hack for Egypt where we literally tried to help the Egyptian revolutionaries, you know, you know the social media revolutionaries, um, come up with tools and technologies to help them uh, create a more transparent um, constitution building process. It, we really, I'm not, I'm not saying we did anything spectacular to influence that, but we created a lot of awareness and thoughtful ideas and, and some tools. It was a really good event. Um, we have our own <laughs> Uh, marketing hero right here, uh, Paul Sinclair is actually uh, one of the lead founders of Marketing Camp. Some people get really excited about the event. Um, and uh, what I wanted to talk about is, uh, you know, organizers are key. What's most important about organizers is to get folks who are, they're going to do the work. They're going to be excited and motivated to do the work. Why? Because there's something in it for them. And that's good. You want there to be something in it for them. Maybe they just simply are passionate about the technology or the topic and they want to learn about it. But it can also be that uh, it creates awareness for them. And they're a consultant or they're looking for a job or um, some other uh, benefit. Okay? Um, uh, maybe it checks off a criteria for a project they got to do. Right? Um, but you want motivated folks. You want, you want there to be something in it for them because this is free. Right, the volunteer project, and um, even volunteers, <laughs> you know, they need motivation. Um, what you don't want are vendors running these events. They can't help but promote them, their company and their product. You can't help it. So you don't want vendors doing this. Uh, it's it's a recipe for disaster. All right, I've done it. I used to be a vendor. I used to be running around selling my technology, and I thought everyone wanted to learn about PayPal. They don't. <laughs> when you're the evangelist, you think they do, but afterward you go, yeah, yeah, maybe not everyone wanted to learn about that. Um, so here's like a, just a rough schedule, basically the same schedule, and we're running out of time here. I think I got like two minutes. So um, the only difference is really in this is that you can add activities, like you can do some sort of hack some sort of competition or something during lunch, where while people are having lunch, you can do demonstrations on the big screen or something like that. Um, you can have a job fair or a career fair or something also, you know, around lunchtime. Um, so you can, the schedule doesn't have to be exactly like this, but, uh, you know, fit in activities that are going to help add uh, to your event. Um, at the very end of the event, I suggest collecting feedback, either in the form of notes that people took, uh, the presentations from the presenters, if somebody did video, uh, collect all of that and provide a place to put it online because it will help 
kind of show that something important happened. And uh, since you don't have a lot of predetermined content necessarily for these events, uh, you do want to show what happened, and this is the best way to do it, just collect notes and other things afterwards. So I'm just curious, um, you know, what your thoughts are. Uh, I know we don't have much time here, but, you know, does a schedule like this or, you know, whatever other idea um, come to mind? You know, what do you think, what do you think about something like a student camp or whatever you want to call it? Yes? I just have, like, uh, is there a fee? No. no, this is, this is, uh, I don't charge a fee for anything. I don't charge a fee for, um, you, you should realize this, I am not selling anything. I am trying to figure out how to make additional services around this to make a living, but I'm not selling anything other than like somebody who might be selling open source, okay? This is like the con open source equivalent of conferences. So how do you get the facility? Because some the colleges want if you get big, yes, but otherwise, no. A lot of a lot of colleges, uh, there's somebody like a professor or an instructor or somebody, uh, a department head or whatever, says, "Yo, we should do this. It's good for us." We're gonna make code camp. What's that? Code camp. Code camp got really big, so they pay for that. It's too big. It's, there's, there's serious expenses when you get that big, so they're paying, you know, in the neighborhood of tens of thousands of dollars uh, to the campus for that. Uh, for me, though, uh, when our events are 200 people or less, I always find free facilities, always. We've probably had, out of the 350 events we've done, probably 100 of them, or maybe like 75 of them, have been at school campuses. And, you know, but again, the events are between 100 and 300 people. It's much more manageable. You really just need like one big room and a couple of breakout rooms and, you know, it all works. So any, pretty much any auditorium or a big classroom would work. This facility is perfect. Yeah, this, this facility is great, everybody. We're out of time.